how many of us uh, grew up with a doorway or a wall where there was measurements taken? Anyone? A couple of us. A couple of us. Yeah, David. David has one. My son. Not King David. You, you, gotta, you had one? Your kids had one. So maybe your kids had one if you didn't, right? Well, I want to kind of talk about that, that wall or, or the, the doorway this morning. Because I have a couple questions that I want to open up with, but I want you to think about that doorway as we go, because sometimes we don't feel like we can measure up when God's calling on us. And that's okay. That's okay, because God is still calling on us. All right? And sometimes God gets frustrated with us. So we're going to talk about a little frustration this morning. Anybody here ever feel frustrated? Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Have you ever done anything that you got results, but they weren't the results you expected, and that created a little frustration in you? How about this? This is a good one. How about asking someone to do something, and they didn't do it, or they, didn't, they did it a certain way and didn't get the results you wanted, right? Anybody ever go to the mechanic or a doctor? Maybe a dentist? You go for a checkup, and they tell you what you don't want to know? Right? No, you didn't do your job right, Dennis. I don't have cavities. Right? So many times things outside of our control create frustration. Here's the thing. Frustration is not a destination. It can create a direction. Here's the thing with direction. Is that when you fall into direction, you could fall into a destination. You could get stuck in that direction and it becomes your destination. But we have to remember that frustration cannot be my destination. It has to be my direction. Where am I going from here? What am I doing? Do we ever tend to get to the point? uh, Do we ever get to the point where we point out the people that create the frustration rather than taking the blame of the frustration ourselves? Oh, it got quiet. That must have hit something. You, get, you start pointing out everybody else's mistakes that create the frus- frustration in your own life instead of taking ownership in the frustration. I want to say something. I put this at the very end. This morning, the Lord, the Lord had me kind of rewrite this message, which is awesome. But here at CNC, just shorten it up, CNC, uh, we do not come up with the frustrations on why people who come to visit don't stay. However, we find the frustrations within ourselves to make the change that will bring people back because they find it hard to live without you. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Here at CNC, we do not come up with the frustrations on why people who come to visit don't stay. We find the frustrations within ourselves to make the change that will bring people back because they find it hard to live without you. Amen. Why do people leave? No, no, no. People are leaving because of me. People are leaving because of you. People are leaving because something's done different. Not, why are they leaving? Oh, it, because they don't like it. No, no. Why are they leaving? Because they weren't capable. No, no. That's not why. We at CNC go, frustration, not their problem, my problem. It creates a measuring stick when frustration hits of what did I do? How can I grow? When we go to the, me- the measuring wall, at CNC, do we see downward growth, wide growth, or height growth? I want you to look at your neighbor and go, vertically challenged? <laughs> now, now I want you to look at me and ask the same question. Yes, absolutely. Because I know that God has something higher for me. So let's, let's dig into the word. Luke 9, verse 37. We're going to dig into a little bit of Jesus' frustration this morning. So Luke 9. If you don't know where that is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book of the New Testament. It's also in the front of your book. You can find the pages or it's up on the screen. All right, give you a couple seconds. Some people are turning there. When Sharon stops, I'm going. So, Sharon, you might want to go slower. I'm, Mallory's a little slower, so... Just kidding. Luke 9, 37. We'll we'll go through 43 if you want to start reading ahead. Please don't. It's easier to 
to preach it if you're not thinking of something already. Um, Luke 9.37 says this, The next day after they had come down the mountain, a large crowd met Jesus. A man in the crowd called out to him, Teacher, I beg you, look at my son, my only child. An evil spirit keeps seizing him, making him scream. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It batters him and hardly even leaves him alone. I begged you, I begged your disciples to cast out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. Jesus said, hmm, I could just stop right there. It would be, oh man, what's Jesus going to say? He's got something good. It's going to be edifying. Let's, let's look at what Jesus says. He says this, verse 41, you faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you and put up with you? Anyone ever feel like that? You're shaking your head no. You've never felt like that, ever. Anyone ever feel like, man, how long do I got to put up with these people? We'll knock it off. Last time I checked, you're not Jesus. Check it out. It continues on. Still in verse 41, right after he said, how long must I be with you to put up with you? Then he said to the man, hmm. Bring your son here. As the boy came forward, the demon knocked him to the ground and threw him into a violent convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit and healed the boy. Then he gave him back to his father. Ah, gripped the people as they saw this majestic display of God's power. Frustration can direct the way we grow. If we sit in frustration, we allow it to be the direction of our lives not just the direction of our moment. We will end up having a destination of frustration. Destination of frustration is not going to lead to a good place in life. You're not going to be happy. You're going to frown a lot and you're going to be upset. We all know those grumpy old men, right? But it can happen to you too. We can't get caught in the trap of Satan when he brings something that frustrates you because he knows your weakness. You have to overcome the frustration of your weakness. We have to overcome the frustration of our weakness. Jesus is frustrated with his disciples, but he's more frustrated because they couldn't do the healing. See, it wasn't the disciples he was as frustrated with, it was the, the faithlessness that he was frustrated with. How many times in life are we frustrated with something because it's a godly frustration? Think about all the things you're frustrated with. Okay, now where's God in those frustrations? The mower doesn't start. I know, I'm just going to pick out a couple of mine. The mower doesn't start. Oh no, I'm frustrated. Oh no, I came out to a car and the, the tire's flat. Oh no, I'm frustrated. Maybe you came out to the tractor. I picked on Mark a little. Right? Rain. Out of your control. How about this? I walk out to my truck a few weeks ago and I saw, I, I look under it just to make sure everything's clean, nice, and I see transmission fluid. Oh, everybody goes, ooh. What you don't know is that that's a normal thing. I knew to look for that. I knew to look for that on this truck because it's a normal maintenance thing. And I said, well, I guess it's time. So I did it. I didn't know I could, but I did it. It, let me, it frustrated me for a second, but then I thought, frustration's not going to fix it. How many times in our life can we say that the frustration in our life has fixed this, the issue in our life? It took action. Frustration might have crept up and it might have made you aware that something's going on. But if you didn't change something in here, if you didn't change something here to go here and go, oh, I got to do something, that frustration would still sit here. And so Jesus is frustrated. And what's he do? All right, I'm going to do something. Hey, get your son over here. Come on. And on the way, I'm, I'm sure this boy's dad was like, come on, stop messing with him, Satan. Frustrated, right? And on the way, Satan messes with him. And Jesus kind of chuckles. Because <laughs> that's Jesus. And nah, you don't mess with, you know, you don't mess with this guy's son. Get out. And it leaves. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that these disciples weren't really happy with Jesus at this moment. 
I mean, we've been following you for how long? You're going to treat us like dirt? Can't you hear Judas saying that? I'm not going to pick on any of the others. Can't you hear Judas saying that? Seriously. Like, you faithless, what are you talking about? I dropped everything for you. Frustration with the master? Anybody ever frustrated with your boss? Knock it off. I love that he tells the disciples that they should, have, they should have way more faith just because he's been around. How many of us can use that lesson this morning? Right? You know, I should have way more faith just because God has been evident in my life. Period. It's, it's right here, black and blue. Here's the thing. Jesus is the example of the one who can say, you are the cause of my frustration. He's the example. Why? Because our frustration is not always based on perfection, but our frustration is typically based on imperfection. Where's his, where's his frustration always based? Always based on imperfection. But he's perfect, and he can do that. We have to be cautious. We have to be cautious. And I'm sorry to tell you this, but uh, I don't think anybody's perfect in here. I don't, sorry, Bonnie. I know you're wonderful. You're amazing. There are some amazingly wonderful people here, but I'm sorry. I don't think anybody's reached perfection yet. Jesus is perfect in you. Yeah. Yeah. And working on you, but I'm sorry, you're not perfect. I, I, I want to dig into a little bit of what Paul says here in, in Galatians. Um, for and I want to I want to see two perspectives. You have Jesus who's frustrated, and then we're going to ha have another teacher who's per who's frustrated. In Galatians four, uh, verse nineteen, it's going to be up on the screen. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains again for you again, and they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were with you right now so I could change my tone, but at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. Paul's frustrated. Why is he frustrated? He states it. Distance. If I was closer to you and I saw you working, I could be there to comfort you and guide you and direct you. But because I'm not, I know no other way. And because of that, I'm frustrated. Because of that, I'm frustrated at you and it's pointed at you. How many of us have been frustrated at a situation and we point it at somebody else that has nothing to do with the situation? If you're married, you should raise your hands, right? 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 You get frustrated, and you, you, know, you turn to the other person that lives in your house, and you're like, Whoa! So much of the time, we're frustrated, and it, we do it. Or, or you, you wake up frustrated, and the next thing you know, your spouse is frustrated at you. Because frustration is contagious. Emotions are contagious. If you're in a bad mood, guess who's going to be in a bad mood with you? Whoever you're around. Do you like being in a bad mood? Some people do. Some people like being frustrated, and they like to get you frustrated. It doesn't take much, right? But what if, what if those people came into your life and it couldn't happen? You couldn't get in a bad mood, even though they're trying. You can't get frustrated, even though they're trying. See, it's a raw, authentic emotion, but there's freedom from it. There's freedom from it. This is like getting angry. You don't have to hold on to the responsibility of being angry. You can leave it to the righteous anger of God, as Romans 12, 12 puts it. You don't have to get angry. You can get angry. You don't have to. You don't have to get frustrated. You can get frustrated but you don't have to. There's nothing wrong with getting frustrated. But how do you act in the midst of your frustration? Remember that wall that we were talking about or that doorway that we're talking about? Frustration should lead us to the doorway of measurement or the wall of measurement to have a self-reflecting time. When we get frustrated, we shouldn't look at what's causing the frustration or what we think is causing the frustration, 
but rather we should turn inward and go, okay, how do I deal with this frustration? How many times do we get frustrated in our week? And we turn in and go, God, why am I frustrated? Help me see what's causing this frustration in my own life. And, and then we will find freedom. It's in that moment we find freedom. See, frustration should be the direction to the wall for growth in our lives. Is the frustration pushing me and feeding my spiritual bones for growth? That's the question. Is it pushing me and feeding my spiritual bones for growth? I'm sorry, but I've, I've reached my, my top height. 6'5 is as far as I'm getting vertically, unless the Lord decides he wants to grow me another couple inches. You know, but spiritually, I want to be 7 foot 1. I want to be 8 foot. I want to be 9 foot. I want to be Goliath's height spiritually. That's weird. I just used an enemy for spiritual recognition. Like, I want to be as tall as God has for me, but I want to reach the heavens for spiritual height. I want, I want heaven not to come to earth every day. I do want that. But I want to wake up, stand up, and be in heaven spiritually. I want to have that growth. But I know without frustration in my life, I can't turn to the wall and go, how, how tall am I, God? And then when I walk up to the wall, I can't ask the questions. I can't ask, Lord, what's wrong with me? Lord, what's going on inside of me? Lord, re help me see. Help me see. Because guess what? I have no control over anyone else except for myself. And if I try to take that control, if I try to push that control, I'm just operating out of frustration rather than out of the love of Jesus. Anybody ever try to take control of everything around them and try to change people's lives for them? I mean, think about it. Have you ever? Have you ever? Every Christian I've ever met at one point or another has tried to change someone for them. Why? Because we're told to preach the gospel. Right? And then if someone doesn't come to the gospel, we're just like, oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> and that's probably true. Yes. But the way we react to them not coming to the gospel is going to speak louder than them trying to come to the gospel. Yeah. Right? What if we opened our arms wider when they said no? Right? Instead of, oh, I'm so frustrated. I want them to get it. Has anyone ever thought, oh, why aren't they getting it? Right? But God is so good that he forgives. Amen. You know, all this frustration and frustration towards someone, it, it's, it gets ridiculous in our lives, but the reality is, is that God says, oh, no, 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 no. Remember what I did to the disciples? I'm the one that allows the frustration to be done. I can be, like Jesus says, I can be frustrated because I'm perfect. I'm sorry, but in anyone's craft or, or their job, have they done everything right every time? What do you have to do to get to that point where you're at now? Learn. So hold on. Jesus never failed. And what that song say? You're never going to let me down. In other words, you're never going to fail me, God. Jesus can't fail. And when he's frustrated, we have to listen. And so going up to that wall in our frustration, we're actually looking to God saying, God, what's the frustration you have with me today? Mm, that just hit somebody. I just got goosebumps. That's good when the Lord says that. You walk up to your measuring wall and you look at the lines that God's put above your head because he's your spiritual daddy. And he... he he puts that you're, you know, when you're a baby, you're down here. But actually, because you didn't know any better, he marked you way up here and then, you know? Like, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. It's, it's, it's not proven. You know, you're, you're marked down here at some point in your life. And, and as you find Jesus, he marks you up and he goes, oh, good and faithful servant. And then, then you go, oh, I don't really, you're in high school and high school things happen and drinking and, and partying. And, and then it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And God shows you how much you've shrunk. And then you have this God, God moment, and God's like, oh, let me get the sledgehammer of love here, and swings it like a baseball bat right across your face, and you're like, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Love me. Forgive me for what I've done. And he goes, okay, we're back up. We're back up to that mark. Right? 
And then what happens? Then we start reading the Bible and he's like, oh, good and faithful servant. Oh, oh, you sinned today. Let's bring you down a little bit. Spiritual height. You lost a little bit, right? Anyone ever feel like in past years, I was so much more spiritual. I was so in it. I read the Bible every day. I prayed in the spirit every day. I was slain in the spirit every day. No one had to pray. Maybe I'm going overboard. But the reality is, is we felt like something better was happening in the past than it is today. And God's saying, well, have you asked me what I'm frustrated about? And if it points, when you pray and he speaks, if you hear him speaking and he's pointing out of you rather than in you, check again. Because your heart should be asking, what's wrong here? I only have control of this. I'll tell you what, I, I've, been, I've been praying with my wife every day for the past like two weeks, and it's been amazing. But we've also been studying the word of God together. And what's funny is we started studying the Word of God together, and she goes, how did you come up with that? And I'm like, how did I come up with what? And we are reading a scripture, and say we are reading Galatians 4, 19 through 20. This is a frustration of God's in my life. I'm sharing it. That we weren't reading together, we weren't praying together every day. We just weren't. We we just didn't do it. It wasn't a practice of ours, but now it is. And so we would read a, a scripture like, oh, my dear children, how I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And she'd, she'd be like, okay, what does that mean? And I'd be like, Paul's a dude. How can he feel labor pains? And she goes, what? What's funny is when you're studying the word of God, don't just read it. Stop. Oh, my dear children, stop. You can't get the next part if you don't know what that part means. Oh, my dear children. He is saying that those people in Galatia are his children. His children. Okay, so if they're his children, he felt birthing pains. Now, I'm a dude. I don't know what physical birthing pains mean, feel like. But I know what the frustration of someone not coming to Jesus feels like. What if I give that to God? instead of the person I'm frustrated with. Isn't that a pain? Because it continues. You can give it to God and He's going to promise you, but it's like, it's not now. And so you become impatient. Oh, frustration brought impatient. But if I give it to God, I know the frustration's real and I become impatient, but I know, I know without, without anything, I know. Lord, you'll never fail me. You're never going to let me down. Never. And so we have to check the frustration in our lives. Because when, when we're doing this, when I would read the Bible with Lola, she wouldn't come up with any. I'd be like asking questions and stuff. And then finally she goes, how did you get that? And I could, I could let her know. I'm telling you there's a 180 change. I'm not asking questions now. She is. Amen. Which is cool. Which is cool. But that's because we're taking reading the Bible to studying the Word. Saying, no, 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 no. I don't care about memorizing it, to be completely honest. I don't, sorry, I would rather study it and hide the values and the morals in my heart of what God's saying, the concepts in my heart, and live those out than be like, oh yeah, yeah, I can call on it and go, oh yeah, um, I think in Galatians, I read this part in Galatians and it said this thing, let's look it up, I, ha- I don't have my phone on me, but I have my iPad, let's, internet, Bible gateway, or Google, uh, where's this verse that says that, oh my dear children, Paul wrote it, Galatians, boom, Galatians 4. Pull it up. I don't ever go outside my house without my phone. So I always have access to Google. So I have a, help, a helper when I'm away from my family to share the gospel with somebody when I don't recognize a reference. Anybody ever have a hard time recognizing references? I just admit it, I do. I mean, I can tell you John eleven thirty five 35 every day. It's two words, Jesus wept. But that's easy. John 3, 16, I can tell you that every day. 17, I can tell you that every day. But if you're not studying the Word of God, you know what those mean. Jesus wept. Question. We should be questioning that. Why did Jesus weep? Right? 
and hence another frustration. When we read the word and we don't understand it. Anyone ever get frustrated? Lord, why aren't you letting me understand this word? I hope that's not just me. I totally went off topic. That's okay. Are we better than the disciples or those people in Galatia? Oh, I'm so glad you said that because my next line was, I could ask if we're better than Jesus. Yeah, we all know that answer. So we're not better than the people in Galatia or the disciples. We're just like them. And so we can take a lesson from this that Jesus gets frustrated at us. It's okay. Yeah. He got frustrated at the disciples because they couldn't heal a guy. How are we different? When was the last time you prayed healing over someone and it didn't happen? Mm, Now I just brought it into exact terms. But God says, it's okay. You know, he... He's frustrated. He lets him know he's frustrated, but then what's he do? Let me show you again. Let me show you again. Did you guys pick that up? Let me show you again. Let me show you again. How many times has he shown us and we still don't pick it up? Let me show you again. The disciples should be thinking right now, is the wall of measurement, where is it? Because I need to find They should be thinking, where's that wall of measurement that I can look inside? Like I said before, I hear them going, I've been with you for three years. I've been, I left everything. Oh, my batteries are done. That's all right. They'll last. I love this. We we should find that wall of measurement and ask the Lord to show, show up. Say, God, I need you to show up right now. Show me, help me, and lead me. Show me, help me, and lead me. Have you ever been in that position that you've just been told what's up and you get frustrated that that person did not encourage you because at least you tried? Someone comes up to you, tells you what to do, and then you're done, and they're frustrated at you and they let you know their frustration. So you get frustrated because they didn't at least acknowledge that you tried. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, that's hard. I told you, frustration's contagious. I think almost 100% positive that the disciples are thinking that right now. I I can't be sure, obviously. So don't, don't take that to the word of God. But I can imagine if it was me if Jesus said that. skin, Jesus. That's exactly where I need you. But sometimes we just don't want him there. Maybe, maybe this is real to us right now. Maybe this, this, you can be like, that's me. That's, that's me in this moment. Maybe that's you. See, the disciples could be thinking, yeah, I didn't measure up. And they'd be right. But Jesus then shows them how to measure up. See, that's the thing. When we spiritually think, I need to go to this wall of measurement. Lord, how, how do I need to measure up today? We should daily go to that wall. I know when I tell my son, hey, let's measure you. He's all excited. Are you guys excited about being spiritually measured today? Yeah. Frustration. No, God, no. Wait till you're frustrated. It'll change your mood. But frustration should set in and we should be like so excited to go to the wall of growth. We should be so excited. It, it's one of those things that like where we go to the wall and we ask God to help me be less vertically challenged today. I'll have the band come on up. Help me be less vertically challenged today. It's good news. Your frustration, even anger, can lead you to the wall of measurement. God, show me where I've failed today already. It's morning, right? It's what? It's almost 11. It's almost 11. I'm not there yet. God, show me. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Lord, show me where I've failed because I want to repair it. I want to fix it. I want to go forward. I want to grow in spiritual attitude with you, God. I want to be the guy that's never frustrated at. I want to be the guy that... When I am frustrated, I can go, oh, it's all good. I'll fix that. 
because I'll look here first. See, God is so good to give us that, that emotion of frustration because it's a measurement of our spiritual growth. It's a measurement of our spiritual growth. I can hear Jesus in some points in my life saying, haven't I been here long enough? Haven't I been here long enough? And I hear, when I hear that, I hear, Jesus is giving me a chance. He's giving me a chance. I walk to that wall and I get that chance. I walk to that wall and I get that chance. Frustration can grow you into something you weren't created to be. Remember that destination? Frustration can lead you in the destination of something you're not supposed to be. Frustration can direct you in the destination of something you're not supposed to be. God did not create the disciples to be failures. Even though in this moment, they're just like you and I, failures. So guess what that means for you and me? We weren't created to be failures, but we fail. I'm going to repeat what I said at the beginning here at CNC. We do not come up with frustrations on why people who come to visit us don't stay. Rather, we find the frustrations within ourselves to make a change that will bring people back because they can't live without you. When they walk in these doors, this is why we change. Because when people walk in this door, they find people they can't live without. No, I need them. I can't wait for next Sunday because I need you. I want to be with you. You know, our vision is a place to live your purpose. Yes. And if we're creating a place to live your purpose, then people are going, I can't live without it. How many of you live without a purpose? Raise your hands. Live without one? How many of you live without a purpose? No. Nah. No, nah, we all have purpose. We all know what it is. People outside this church don't know what theirs is. What you going to do about it? What you going to do about it? If people have a place to live their purpose, I promise you, they'll find a place to stay. They'll feel warmth and arms. They'll feel Jesus. But if we sit in a life of frustration, it will stun our growth. Frustration will stunt our growth if we let it become our destination rather than our direction. 